And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple. <coughs> Coming to us all the way from Strange Machine Games, and the and the the creator and head honcho of the of Robotech, the Ma the Macross role, the Macross Saga role playing game, now now kickstarting their their first full on expansion with Robotech Homefront. The one and only, and yes, I'm, and yes, I'm aware of the pun, and so and so is he, Jeff Maklinski. How you doing today, man? I am doing well. Thanks for having me. Thank you for thank you for coming. Thank you for coming on. Um, I'd like to, I'd like I often start at the humble beginnings in this in this kind of thing. Um, so with that in, with that in mind, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Uh, so what? When did I first start playing games, or yeah? When did I start developing them, or well, we'll we'll start we'll start with column A and then move to column B. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, you know, I don't know. I was like in middle school or, or early high school. I think I was in middle school, mm -hmm. and I was just interested in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I had I had seen, you know, the cartoon a little bit when I was on TV. And I'd seen some, you know, kids shows where they were sort of playing either sort of like more LARPing before it was known as LARPing and mm -hmm. or just whatever. And I was like, oh, my God, that's really cool. Like this whole like concept of being in this like fantasy world and having like the powers and being able to like, you know, do stuff. And, um, you know, my one of my friends had like the red box, blue box. It was like the beginners. People would know, you know, people of my age would know like the red box and like the, like the teal box for D&D. &D. Yeah, that, um, that'd be Beck Me era. Yeah, yeah. And so I had some of those books and was really enthralled. And then um, second edition had come out, uh, AD&D second edition. And I never had, like, the did I, I never had the rule book for that. But I got a Monsters Compendium and I got um, Tales of the Dragon, I think, which was a uh, Dragonlance module. Which was beautiful, right? These old modules TSR put out, they were like in boxes and they had books and like cards and the cards were like real thick and they had maps. And it was for the uh, the second continent, right? The lesser known continent of Kryn, which is the Dragonlance, uh, the Dragonlance world. And man, I just like couldn't get enough of it. And so I was actually like playing the old like, I was using the rules out of, like, the red book and, the, like, the blue book as, like, the basic and advanced, right? Mm -hmm. But, like, using the, using the monsters, I was, like, kind of, like... But I didn't really have anyone to play with. I had, like, two friends to play with. So um, when I changed schools and came up towards Baltimore, if I lived on the eastern shore of Maryland, it's pretty rural, um, like, mm -hmm. all the people who I became friends with were just into it. It was just like, hey, wait, you, you like this stuff too? And so, yeah, we, we, we played some uh, second edition then. Well, when I went off to college, um, well, then then the 90s, right? right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about the 90s, which some people would call a golden age of role-playing games because at that point in time, D&D sort of faded away. And people played other things, right? That's when White Wolf came out, uh, Shadowrun had some you know, success mm -hmm. and grew. And so we played all that stuff, like Shadowrun and, um, and, and um, World of Darkness, um, Vampire the Masquerade at the time, and then uh, Werewolf came out, The Apocalypse. So we played all that stuff. Um, riffs, we were really big into the Riffs and the Palladium, the Palladium stuff, along with Robotech a little bit. Robotech was sort of like, hey, if you want to have a Veritech, throw it in, but they were always weaker than the rest of the Riff stuff. Yeah. Um, and so then I went off to college, and I kind of got into a group and was playing some games, a bunch of different stuff, Call of Cthulhu and some other stuff. And I remember I just like started to work on a game. I'm like, I want to make design a game. So I was saying, I, I went to design school, right? I'm a classically trained industrial designer. And mm -hmm. quite honestly, you'll probably never meet another industrial designer. We only, there's only like, you know, 10 schools, 15 schools graduating, like 30 students a year, right? So it's not, it's not like that many people do it. Um, 
So, but I just have this like love for creation, design. I build furniture, and um, um, I just like to make stuff. I can I can make a lot of stuff, and so I started designing um, a game. Right, I called it Age Past, and I it was a completely new take um, on how to do things in an RPG. It was kind of stripped down a little bit, but then sort of as I was working on it, trying to play test it, D and D three point oh came out, and that was like whoa it's D, but with like skills cool like d it's like modern D D. it's like D D's modernized right and of course looking back now it seems like a dinosaur but um yeah so we played a lot of 3.0 and then school ended 3.5 and you know some other things um exalted but then i you know decided to just um continue my design work because i kind of got frustrated with D D and it got complicated and messy and it just it wasn't providing it was, it was so bottom-up designed right so just so bottom-up designed i needed something so i started working on my i started working on my age pass game and spent like five years developing a lot of play testing i ran like two 20 game campaigns to really like really like you know it's, it's a huge book 400 pages two hundred and seventy thousand words and uh you know it's it's all in there it's sort of like a in a way a little bit of like an f you to like the rest of the game community because instead of needing it has 70 monsters in there you didn't really need a monster manual because it's all in there right it had some world building it had some you know it definitely needs more stuff like but but you know it was all really self-contained the gm section is in the book as well um and the reason we could do that is because you can make like it's like you can make more characters and grains of sand on the earth in the system mm -hmm. so you don't need like a lot of I and mean, if you look at the standard your standard like dnds type game right most of it's set up on your classes and uh your spells so if you compress that and you can fit more into a smaller area you get a lot more real estate for other stuff so yeah i launched it on kickstarter in 2011 and i got it out 2013 finally it took a little while um because really i didn't know what the freaking i was doing you know was, um you know and really i just looked at a uh, looked at do, doing things a lot differently and i think it was good i just don't think i quite grasped the design concept at the time so then i rewrote um age pass into the revised edition which is in its current form mm -hmm. it doesn't make any money it's a it's a beautiful game um, it has some flaws but also does some awesome really cool different things so and of course now i'm developing the 2.0 version so we're gonna start play testing that out a little bit here and there but you know, at the time, oh, and then I then I did Super Age, which is sort of like the superheroes game. I, I was on um, a forum, which is now Random Worlds, but it was you know an IRC. It was the um, RPG Net IRC, unofficial RPG Net IRC that uh, um, um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. I'm sorry, I completely blanked on it. Uh, that Dan runs. I'm just trying yeah, to his last um, name. Dan Davenport. Yes, Dan Davenport. There you go. Yes, let's bring up my Facebook. Um, I know he's got a Kickstarter. It's definitely a good shout out. There's a lot of good people on that. Um, well, now I guess it's a Discord. But yeah, I was in there and people were just kind of talking about like supers and how hard it was in this crazy like way that they're, you know, they're kind of like just theory crafting. I was like, well, this isn't that hard. So I'm like, screw it. I'll just do a super superhero game. And I did it and it was good. <laughs> so I, I made that and published it. <laughs> A superheroes game, and then you know I, I've gone to ten Gen Cons in a row now, or eleven, I can't remember. So my friend and I were coming back from Gen Con, and we're like, let's do a board game. We're like, cool. And then we decided, like, what do we want to do? We need an IP, and the Attack of Titan was like the, the number one thing that came up, and then the next thing came up was Robotech. So I called Army Gold, asked for licensing, and then, lo and behold, we started making Robotech games. Mm -hmm. Of course, at that time, the RPG was not available. Everyone knew about Palladiums. I'll just use the word bungle. So I was, you know, trying and contacting Harmony Gold, you know, in, in our board game talks, every once in a while I'd bring up the RPG. So, you know, we published we published a bunch of board games. Uh, we have a new one coming out too, which is really awesome, um, uh, called Robotech Reconstruction, which some people say is better than Root. I can't say that because I've never played Root, but it is a really cool game that two in crazy smart people, like MIT-level smart people, um, crafted over two years mm -hmm. so we're really excited for it um but yeah we've we've we made like five robotech games and and then in the in the at some point the license dropped i think fantasy flight or somebody i don't know who exactly they wouldn't tell me but somebody big was in was looking at the license um an exclusive license i don't and so yeah i um i don't know i don't know who i don't know who it 
I don't know um, who was looking into it. If it was Fantasy Flight, I, f I um, I ca I kind of I kind of doubt it was Fantasy Flight simply yeah, because been, yeah. simply because the timeline doesn't match up. Because around the around the time that that had happened, Fantasy Flight was going a whole hog into building the Genesis system and put and putting out and um built and putting a lot more stuff for Star Wars. Plus, um, I think that I think there was. I think there was still the transitional part of them being acquired by Asmini. So, timeline just... It's, I'm not saying that didn't happen, it's just that I'd ha I have a hard time believing it because of the timeline. Yeah, yeah. I just threw them out. Like, I, I don't actually think it was n literally them, but so, I think a bigger company like that, you know, that's what we are sort of told by, um, by Harmony Gold... But it really just kind of like you know held things up because then they pulled out for whatever reason. So then we almost got it a second time, but then another company out of Singapore came in and they started negotiating for it, which was kind of, um, which was also frustrating because they wanted to make toys, and then Harmony Gold had to figure that out, figure out that like, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, Harmony Gold had to figure out that like they want to do toys and we want to do books and then so and then for wasn't gonna be an overlap so that's what happened they kind of like split it up into two i, I don't know why they just kind of i guess the other group thought they needed to do um i'm not gonna mention their name but they needed to do toys to, to get the rpg license to get the toy license I, I don't i don't quite understand it but finally we got it all worked out mm -hmm. And so, and, you know, we, we got the license and started developing. I had some ideas about what I wanted to do. I'd actually test it out a little bit. Um, you know, start, uh, started doing a, um, a mecha game based on the Super Age system, but it just didn't quite work out. It, do, it didn't quite capture um, what mecha combat was really about. So, um, you know, I started, once we got Robotech, you know, I had, I had some parameters. Um, I had some, you know, basically, you know, I started going through a design process, which I can kind of get into. But, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, 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 that's the way we went about it. You know? Yeah. And uh, from my own perspective, I did think it was kind of amusing that, um, two, that two separate companies ended up making Robotech RPGs um, um, mm -hmm. around, the same t around the same time. They're... There was obviously you guys. That was one of them, but there was another company who, whose name currently escapes me. That um, Battlefield Press. Yeah, Battlefield Press, who did the, mm -hmm. who did the version on Savage Worlds. Sure. Yeah. Um, and ar around this t around this time, I started seeing um, some of Palladium's other stuff get Savage Worlds adaptations, like Rifts, um, which is the which was which right. um, was which. To me, to me, um, I had to I had to laugh because of how stubborn CM Beta was over over the years regarding peep regarding his regarding rifts or anything Palladium related getting adapted into other systems. Um, but when it came, we extend that license to them. <laughs> uh, okay, so we that... thought it was a good idea because we knew we knew our system. Mm -hmm. We knew our system wouldn't be appreciated by everybody. We knew we were doing different things. The system is plays different than anything that's out there. Yeah. Bar none. It, it, there's a few things it takes from, but for the most part, in fact, I didn't even realize it took from them. I found out later. Um, mm -hmm. But and this was part of that top-down design process. Right, we talked about design process because mm -hmm. I don't really see actually a lot of design happening in RPGs, and um, like so we can get to that later. But like. Um, you know, so I said we we need something for the masses. We need something for people that that want to absorb common gaming, and so that's what you know standard what I call standard simulation gaming or GM fiat based gaming, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what the um, Savage Worlds edition was for. Yeah. So people could you know take that, and a lot of people play it, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's ubiquitous. It's out there, and I think Savage Worlds is a great is a great system for baseline you know for baseline multi genre play, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, and with the now with that in, with that in mind, you talk you've talked about do you've talked about doing things different and mm -hmm. and that sort of that sort of top down design. Um, mm -hmm. given given the fact that the er, the earliest kernel of this was the essentially you know, essentially mecha hack of 
of su of Super Age. I th I think mm -hmm. I'd like to start with that in terms of what was it about what was it about that that didn't satisfy you that you wanted to try and accommodate when you were developing the Robotech RPG. So um, so Super Age Super Age is very different from a lot of games because and both so both Super Age Super Age is, is was top down designed mm -hmm. for to give you a comic book or basically to give you cinematic to give you a cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we talk about if we talk about like what does that mean? So when you watch a cartoon, right, or you or you watch the movie, it's it was literally designed. That was the problem in mind. Like when I play a superheroes game, this is the problem, right? The problem identified. When I play a superheroes game, I don't feel like what's ha what I'm doing in the game is what's on the screen or what I see in the comics. Mm -hmm. so that was the sole, quite literally. Well, okay, there was maybe two problems, but that was like the really that was like probably seventy five percent of 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 the um of the problem targeting, right? The the, the problem identification, right? Mm -hmm. The other like lesser twenty five percent was I wouldn't be able to play any hero. Yeah. And really there's a tiny little one that's even beyond that, which was like and everybody has to feel like they're accomplishing something, right, in the game. Yeah. So um but the Super Age is not a friendly game, right? From the standpoint of, you can have a Superman-like character out with like a investigation character, and the investigation character can—I'll just—I'll just be hyperbolic and say—can die in one hit, mm -hmm. um, and Superman basically can't be hurt, right? So you can play a team like that, right? One person can be playing somebody so hard you can't even really hurt them; you really got to punch on them a lot, and the other person can basically die in one hit, right? You can make that—that—that that, that can happen, and you're, you're using the same build point system to do that, right? You spend your hundred point system to do that. So the game is designed to let players play exactly. And the way it works is it's, it's a curated system. It's a curated action system. So basically there are only five things you could ever do. And every turn you get to choose one. And it's basically attack. We call it overpower because it's a better, a better um, semantic than attack. But you have attack, defend, um, counter, which is the weird one, interact, and assist. Mm -hmm. the only things you can do. And every turn you get to choose one. And the first thing we did was we broke it up, we broke Super Age out into say, okay, instead of saying your turn is six seconds, right? Instead of saying it was a six second initiative, you you just get some amount of time, right? You get a, you get a few moments, a few seconds, right? Maybe it's fifteen seconds to do something, maybe it's um, maybe it's thirty seconds, maybe it's one second, but you get this like block of time to do something. And so basically, you get to kind of exude what you want to do, that that's you know reasonable for that amount of time. The next thing we did is we got rid of initiative. Initiative doesn't exist in the system. You kind of play it simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So everybody says what they want to do, and then the GM works it out. So basically, you know, it's, it's all based on fictional positioning. If I got my finger on the doomsday button, and you're the flash, and you can move so fast, then you get initiative over me being able to push that button, right? If, however, if I got my finger on the button and you have a gun, you have to, like, raise the gun, you have to aim it, you have to pull the trigger, the bullet has to fly, I could probably push the button first, right? Mm -hmm. So... Um, the GM would just work out in the initiative like what happens based on what's out there. And in the system you literally can play a character that can that can run a thousand miles in a turn, in a standard like, you know you know, a standard so many second turn. Um so so I took that, that kind of system, right? That that those five things that you do, and we try to take that into like the space realm with mecha. And the problem was is that mecha are mecha are a little more like like D and D classes, right? They're a little more what I call flat. And like in D and D, the ranger might be doing more damage than the bard, but he's not doing like ten or twenty or thirty times more damage than the bard. He might be doing like one and a half times more damage or two two times more damage, right? Same thing with like hit points, right? I mean, if you're talking about the most hit points a character can have versus the least, so it's a little vast. But for the most part, you're kind of like in that two thirds, uh, one third, two third range, right? So no one's really getting more than like fifty percent hit points over you, over the you know from bottom to top. All right, and same thing, the armor classes, the percentage of, of hit chances, right? If I'm stronger than you, I'm stronger than you by like 20, 30, 40%. I'm not stronger than you by like two, three times. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you're only, you're, you're only, you're only really uh, more talented by 5% in, in, in like a, a, um, a die 20 game um, because of the points of resolution you have, right? Which is 5%. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, the mecha are a little more, a little more flat, right? Like, your hard hitting mecha is still going to do maybe like three times the damage of the low hitting mecha, but the low hitting mecha can still do stuff. So it didn't just really work. It didn't feel like the mechas were clashing and bouncing off each other and flying at each other and, and, um, you know, really being able to do what they can do. So 
I decided to make it more complex, right? I decided to take two actions and let you fuse those two actions into a synergy. And so every single time you were trying to do, take two like disparate, take two um, uh, disparate actions, but like get something, one really cool thing out of it. And the way we did, the way that it kind of worked out is we made it so that your skills attach to an action. So you can say that um, my, my, it's not, I can get into this later, but like the sword attack goes to an action, which could be attack. And then I could say my shield would help me defend, right? So that I can do an attack and defend and depending on the fictional positioning, yada, 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 like I can create a synergy out of that. Um, and that worked a little better. The problem is the synergies were a little too open and mechanically they were hard to define. So we kind of got rid of that. We just gave you a hero point. Um, now, one of my game designers uh, who I worked with, Oscar Simmons, who did the narrative rules for Robotech, he really liked the synergies. <laughs> he thought they were awesome. So, uh, you know, he's like, oh, why'd you take them out? So we might put them back in the next the next book, but, um, you know, or give people ideas for them or something. But yeah. So... It, so mecha are doing a lot of things, right? You got the head guns, right? And the, the head guns are these like little machine guns, usually. Mm. Well, what are what are they doing? Well, in BattleTech, machine guns don't do very much damage, but if your armor's already blown off, they'll bounce around inside and like screw up your electronics, right? They'll like mm. knock out your your avionics and stuff. Um, so I kind of had this concept that you know, like defensive guns, as I called them, could only be used at like really close range, and they really didn't do anything. But if they got a critical hit, it'd be a really cool critical hit. We had these um, other concepts for, you know, defensive guns for shooting down missiles, armor, you know, um, uh, shields. If I had a shield and you have a laser beam, the laser beam goes right shoot through the shield. But if you have a magnetic shield and I have like a physical bullet, it could like, you know, whatever, right? So we had different kinds of shields and fields and trying to like get what happens in the in the show to like in the in the anime we see like to really come to life. Mm -hmm. It was just really hard to do. Um, so, so by making the double actions and then really defining what those actions are. So Robotech has like nine actions where super, super agent only has five mm -hmm. and Robotech, you have, um, observe, which is you're looking out into the world, right? Now you have two types of observe. You have a target observe, like I'm looking at that asteroid versus a area observe, I'm looking at all the asteroids. And from a mechanical standpoint, you have, if you're doing an area observe, you have your number of successes. Mm -hmm. right? It's just like, hey, I wanna know if something's going on. Um, so you have the you have observe, then there's obscure. And obscure is kind of like the diametric you know, opposite of obscure, uh, of, of observe, right? You're trying to hide yourself or you're trying to hide someone else. Mm -hmm. um, then, there's a, then there's assist. And assist is um, like the third, the third um, action you're doing something to help somebody else. So your successes translate to somebody else. Then we have attack and defend. Attack is the only way to actually cause damage to, to, to your target. Defend is the only way to reduce damage that is incoming to you. And then we have, we call redirect. And redirect is like a maneuver. It lets you push someone over or do something, right? Um, it lets you get a positioning on them um, literal positioning on them, remove their positioning in some which way, shape, or form. Uh, then we have interact and inhibit. And interact is like hacking a terminal, and inhibiting is like I'm trying to stop you from hacking the terminal. I'm trying to like, counter hack or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we basically we kind of made it a little more a little more um, um, open end. We made it a little more succinct, right? So in Super Age, like if you want to obscure yourself you would roll one of your stats and you have to get so many successes and you can't be seen right it's it's actually like it you're, you're hitting thresholds and things right mm -hmm. um so that worked really well because the power systems this power system is super age right the actual powers you get modifies the base rule or lets you do those special things right you can't just like you you can't you, you can get the drop, but it's called getting the drop. You can get the drop on somebody. Mm -hmm. but remember, everything plays out simo. So if you get the drop on somebody, your damage happens at the same time their damage happens. But if you do enough damage to inhibit them or kill them, then they don't, their damage doesn't confer to you. If you don't, well, then you just... Because, you, you know, it's like you come back, you hit, you hit Superman on the back of the head with a frying pan. Mm -hmm. He's just going to turn around and punch you. So, um, but if you can knock someone out, then they don't turn and punch you. So that's sort of like how the simo aspect of Super Age works. Now, with Robotech... 
it was messy, right? We had these nine actions, people doing these things, people couldn't figure out like how to do stuff. This is a new system, right? You're applying these two actions, you're using your skills, which we still haven't talked about yet, <laughs> but you're applying your skills to those actions and it got really confusing for people. Mm -hmm. um, and the initiative was a mess and everything because once again, we did simultaneous initiative because it worked so well for Super Age. Mm -hmm. So luckily, one of my friends, after a very frustrating, um, one of very frustrating role playing uh, um, a play play session. Now, granted, some people could do this; wouldn't be a problem. But it was kind of hard for some people. He said, "Hey, this is what you want to do, right? Mm -hmm. You want to make people feel, feel a little special. So if someone's assisting, like you want to like give them the spotlight when they assist. You want to like break and let them do that first, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, oh, cool. Well, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna break out. We're gonna break out a standard round into phases." this is really great because in Robotech, it's not like, it's not like a D&D type system. It's not like, um, you know, it, it's more of a narrative system from the approach for how you do combat. Now, when I say that, it's not a narrative game. So, like, if you play a PPTA game, a lot of them, you, there's not really a different, we call it a flat system, right? So the yeah. same way that I try to overcome an enemy in combat is the same way that I hack a terminal. There's no, there's, it's the same rule set for doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, D and D, it's like all of a sudden, boom! Now I have I'm playing my game, playing my game, playing my game, right? Doing all my stuff, and now we're going to combat. I'm using initiative, which the only time initiative is ever used is for combat, and then, and now I'm also like, have all these other rules that have nothing to do with the rest of the game, right? It's nothing to do with this other experience I was having, right? Mm -hmm. So we're able to take this break break our actions into three sections. We call support, ops, and cinematic. And that's your observing, obscuring, assisting at the top. And that goes first. And the next thing is the attacking, defending, redirecting. And the third thing, because it's the slowest, is like, you know, opening a door, picking up your friend, hacking a terminal, that interacting, inhibiting. Mm -hmm. So um, we also added a pre-phase. And that pre-phase is a communication phase. You actually get to talk about what you want to do. Mm -hmm because you're assumed to be in comms. So everybody gets to talk about the, the situation. I haven't gotten to the situation yet either. We'll get there too. So you have the situation in front of you, all this stuff's going on, it's Robotech, it's space opera. Now it doesn't matter if you're in a combat, you're in a ballroom, right? It's the same thing. In fact, you could have somebody in a ballroom and in combat at the same time. And that's what's great about the system. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody's doing something really cool and everybody's doing something really important. So, um, So what happens is you get to talk about what you want to do when you see the problems in front of you. And then after you see the problems, you get to then determine the actions you want to take. And then it ties into fictional position. There's, there's a bunch of other things. There's integrative design, right? It's kind of hard to talk about because there's so many things that integrate into it. Mm -hmm. So that was a really long-winded <laughs> answer to your very simple question of how do you go from Super Age to Robotech? <laughs> yeah. Now... I suppose now the next the next thing that I that I wanted to ask is um is some something that I something that I see crop crop up with mecha RPGs and I'd say the I'd say the only other the only other game I've seen that really tr really tries to address this discrepancy was Battle Century G which I did, which mm -hmm. I reviewed um about about two years ago I think mm -hmm. um and that it that is. The, that is the question of the imp of importance of character customization and mecha customization. Mm -hmm. Um, because in some ca in some cases, like say BattleTech, <laughs> the customization is ninety percent going to be towards the mech. Um, whereas in in something like say Cthulhu Tech, um, most of the customization is going to be on the character. Um, whereas you've whereas you've got it split it split down. Um, fifty-fifty, and I know that I know that there's ki that there's kind of subsystems when it comes to controlling the controlling characters versus controlling mechs. But were but um was there were there attempts early on to try and have a fully integrated setup before the before the half and half system that you currently have developed? So, um. There was a couple decisions, lore decisions, based on like the mecha side, right? So mm -hmm. you're in a, you're basically in a military unit, right? So you're getting requisitioned equipment. You don't really have a lot of say over what you get. Mm -hmm. So we ran the mecha kind of stock. Now you do get powers, or we, in, the, in Robotech we call them talents. You don't really have powers. You have talents, and talents you get extra requisition, you get extra stuff. 
Um, that can kind of help you customize a little bit. And then we did put the stinger rules in. They'll let you kind of like, they're very basic rules for building a custom mecha. It's very basic, but people have gotten a lot of value out of it. <clears throat> because Robotech's really about space opera. It's, you know, if you actually watch it, there's not that much combat that happens, you know? And I, to for a lot of people, a lot of like 55-year-old men, they see it as nothing but combat. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know it, it's, there's definitely a lot of that, and that's really cool, but it's also, you know, there's very much a space opera, right? It's, it's very dramatic and over the top in a lot of ways. Um, and just ridiculous, um, but also deep at times too, right? So it, it has a lot going on in it. The character standpoint, once again, because we're dealing with these scales, right? And the scale of Robotech is really at the mecha level. Mm -hmm. But we had to address that there's also um, a scale that happens, you know, at the personal level, right? The human, the human size level, and then there's the naval vessels, which are just massive. Uh, they're actually so big; it's they're a little, they're a little weird to deal with. But, mm -hmm. but yeah. So, and we we had to recognize those too. So we start looking at the scale, and you look at all the elements you need, and because it's really the system really runs on the action system. That's where the emphasis of the game is. So we didn't emphasize massive character, right? Character, um, character building. The characters are very, I don't say stripped down, but they're very elegant, right? You, you get exactly what you need, not really a lot more. Um, we haven't really had, interestingly enough, you can make a character in like 15 minutes, even 10 minutes if you know the system, and we haven't really gotten any complaints that the characters seem to boring or basic everyone really loves their characters when they make them and mm -hmm. it's just a very simple build system so yeah the goal the goal was you know when you just when you look at you know say when you look from a top-down design standpoint right you're 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 you know maybe i should get to this as well sorry right? so mm -hmm. design is about the design's about basically three or four things right the first thing is is evaluation right you evaluate something right the second thing is you identify problems. Okay? The third thing is you put a design process in to solve problems, right? And that, you know, being a classic industrial designer, I have like hundreds of pages of tools <laughs> to do that, right? It's not just about drawing pretty pictures, right? People think, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then the 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 last thing is is um, is evaluating. I use evaluation twice, but the last thing is like evaluating or um, proving out. Um, those decisions and you basically loop it you keep doing it you keep going right in loops of those four things so if you're not identifying problems you're not solving the problem that you're identifying right and you're not evaluating what you've what you've evaluating like realistically right i mean uh, credibly evaluating it auditing yourself then you're not really designing if you're not doing those things right you're mm -hmm. you're making something right you're, and it's fine you're creating but it's not necessarily designing and the interesting thing is, like, in board games, we hear terms like top-down, bottom-up, horizontal play, vertical play, ludonarrative dissidence, right? We hear these things so much in video games and board games, but you don't hear any of this in the role-playing game, in the role-playing game industry. And I think it's so much more driven from um, a standpoint of the historical context, what's already been made, right? I think, like, a lot of people in their minds know exactly what an RPG is and always will be. And I think it's, you know, really driven by, like, what the Forge was and philosophical, like, mm -hmm. um, narratives and, or um, theorems, I guess you could say, philosophical theorems, psychological theorems, writing theorems, right? And, like, not a lot of those have a lot, of, there, there's, some, there's some design overlap in, like, writing, storytelling and stuff, you know, when you do it right, when you yeah. set up your story webs and, you, you know, but I, I don't really see that happening in RPG, in the RPG industry hardly at all. Oh. Um. I'd say I'd say a lot of that I'd say a lot of that has to do with what I what I call design by gospel. Yeah, right. Uh, and then once again, but if you're designing by gospel, you're not designing because <laughs> you're not <laughs> you're not going through the the steps well, of what design is. <laughs> I might get if you'll excuse me for getting a little hyperbolic. I always describe it like this: we design yeah. it this way because this is the way we've designed it because we've always designed it this way because this is the way we designed it. Yeah. If that sounds confusing, that's the point. Right, right. But from my standpoint, and you know, this is from me being hyperbolic, it's not effing design, right? It's, it's you're creating. It's like, you know, if I throw paint on the wall, it's art, it might be beautiful, it might be worth a million dollars, but it's not design. 
People and, pay, people you know, pay money for people spend hundreds of dollars on Jackson Pollock paintings. Yeah, I mean, people, right? I mean, and that's fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but you know, it's not design. I mean, like if if people design board games the way people design RPGs, it'd be like a mess, right? <laughs> um, it's already it's a, already du it's already dumb enough that you that you that um that pe that some sections still argue about the whole the whole the whole th the whole Ameritrash deba debate in some circles. Oh, yeah. Which right. um, I remember, I remember being in, I remember being right in the middle of one of those debates, and I and I just I just ju I just couldn't take it anymore. And I jumped in and said, "Ladies, ladies, you're both ugly." <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you know when when we talk about um, when we talk about these things, right? So when you see more narrative games, right? Mm -hmm. um, Fate has a little more design in it. Um, you know, even Alien did a little bit with like the whole fear system they put put in place. Um, but if you really look at like the P the PBTA games, the Blades games, right? They're they're curating an experience, right? They're they've gone through a design process, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and they're you know they're extremely narrative and it sets up a narrative meta. So the one thing that sort of frustrates and this is personal, right? And this has nothing to do with your opinion or anyone else's opinion, and this is completely opinions, right? But what frustrates me. Is when I play a game, I don't like to get into like what I call meta state, right? If I'm playing a game like D and D, right, uh, a standard what I call standard simulation game or GM fiat based game, because the GM has total fiat, fiat fiat game. Mm -hmm. And I can get to that a little bit more later too. But um, when you when you play a you know a standard simulation game, you're they're always talking about like this the the standard simulation mechanics, right? You're always talking about the mechanics, right? You're always talking about how, like, well, if I can do this and I can do that, right? And you're not just role playing, right? You're you're basically playing a board game, right? And you're talking at the table, like, at the board. You're not, like, in character. I mean, in character, you don't have to, like, make voices and stuff. But, you know, like, like making decisions about what's going on in the game tends to turn into you're stepping away from the game to look at, you know, the 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 bottom-up elements that are that are provided to you so you can, you know, attempt to attempt a thing, right? Mm -hmm. One of the issues with narrative games is they do the same thing, but it's about the story, right? So the... You'll do something, and then okay, now we have to stop playing the game to talk about what does that mean for the story? What does that mean for you? What does that mean for the other players? What does that mean for the GM? Right? And some games even have like a double. I think it's like the um, uh, the sprawl, which is I think it's based on like tech noir, but it adds even like a second meta meta narrative layer in. The sprawl okay, is the sprawl isn't based on tech noir. The sprawl is based on um P is based on PBTA. Um, really? Okay. The only. The only game that the only game that's out there that's based on tech noir is mech noir, and calling that based on is um is sure. a bit is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> okay, but the the point is, if you actually listen to people playing, right, they're spending so much time talking about like what does this mean. So like for me, I like to push tin. I'm a pretty intense person. Like when I play, when I drive somewhere, I want to get there, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that sometimes I don't have a, have a have a nice easy drive, but like like I don't want to stop for gas, you know five times if I'm driving 10 miles, mm -hmm. you know? And that's what I feel like both of these types of systems do. So the, one of the, that was one of the problems we're trying to solve with Robotech is you just play it. You just play it. There's a little mm -hmm. bit of a meta narrative phase um, that you can discuss what you want to do with your friends. And then there's a little bit of a meta narrative phase where the GM provides you with information. But like other than that, you're basically, you're basically everything you're doing is integrated with your play, right? Mm -hmm. The mechanics, the narrative, it's all integrated. So you don't really ever have to come out of like your, you don't, unless there's a question, right? Which is reasonable. We even actually set it up in the, in the games. We say that players should only engage the GM with questions, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, because, because we want them to say, I want to do this. I do right. find that, that is, I do find that in, I do find that interesting because I've I um something that I've something that I've noticed with especially with the more rise of more prevalent narrativist games is this idea that narrative and mechanics are mutually exclusive. Right. That if Completely you that if false. you if you were if you need if you want to have a bigger emphasis on the narrative on the story for lack of a better term mm -hmm. that you can't ha you can't have a you can't have a degree of mechanical depth. Right. Um, Completely false. Completely. Right. And really, is. when we talk about mechanics, players don't engage with mechanics. Players engage with procedures. Mm -hmm. And so really, very rarely are when people have like mechanics, 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 right? It's like we're talking about mechanics, right? It's like it's a procedures, right? You are 
the, the game instructs you to do something, right? Or mm-hmm. gives you the option of many things, depending on the level of curation and what it's trying to do. And you follow the procedure, right? You do the procedure. I roll the die, right? Um, I add this to that. You're not really, it's like, it's like your car's engine, right? Your car's engine has a ton of mechanics in it, but you don't like get, you don't open up the hood and like throw a weasel in there and then like pull a lever and then boom, your car starts up. Yeah, you turn the key (laughs) or now you just hit a button. (laughs) And I think, I think we want to get away from the whole mechanics, right? Thing. Um, when we talk about player interaction, right? Because players, like I said, the, I call like the user interface. It's UXI, the player, right? The player experience, mm-hmm. the user experience, right? Isn't with the mechanics; it's with the procedures. Now they're run by the mechanics, okay, man, it's semantics, but like, still, I think there's a, a big enough difference there that that we want to start looking at ways to do things mm-hmm. from the way that the players engage the system. And this is very much an industrial design philosophy. It's also a QFD, quality function deployment philosophy. Um, which is why the Japanese automakers beat out the beat out the U.S. automakers in the '80s, you know. Um, so you know you can you guys can look up QFD and the mm-hmm. the uh, what QFD is involved into. It's actually really fascinating if you actually care about systems. Like I'm I'm definitely a system person, mm-hmm. and that's why I do it. My day job in aerospace is is I do I'm a systems quality systems is what I do. Mm-hmm. No. Yes, yeah, so as you were saying, you 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 do not have to lose, and I think. Unfortunately, it's just so messy. It's such a messy game, but Burning Wheel is probably, Burning Wheel and Robotech are probably the two examples that sit in the middle of narrative and what I call simulation as gaming. Mm-hmm. It's, I, should, I should note that when using terms like narrative and simulation, I will admit that, yes, that is something that I, that I blatantly stole from Ron Edwards' GNS theory. Um, which I know, I know yeah. he sa- I know he says is out of date, but the thing he tried to replace it with didn't stick, so be- because it's, you, you it's should fine. Stick. I mean, it's a scale or whatever, oh. you know. Um, although I think I think the big mistake that he made with GNS theory was th- was the idea was the idea that you have to that you can't that you can't accommodate more than one style. Right. Yes. Yes. Oh. And so a lot of right, going back to like the character development, the mecha development, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, we, we had to be like, okay, what do the, what do these mechas have? They have lasers. They got, they got short range lasers. They got long range lasers. They got missiles. They got penetrating lasers. They have, you know, this and that, and they could transform. And so we had to take all those elements and ma- make them meaningful to the game. Mm-hmm. And so at some point you got to start pulling back on something. And so the way that the Robotech system leverages everything is through an, an a skill a skill based intent system and this gets the heart of like the exact middle ground of like narrative and uh, simulation gaming so your character skills are not strength agility um whatever charisma your character skills are i've got this mm-hmm. or wing in a prayer mm-hmm. or chain fire or I can fix it. Did I say that one already? Or um, uh, grand presence. Or ambush tactics. Or angelic grace. Right. And the the concept comes from from if you do something with enough of something, you always accomplish it. Right. If I have enough angelic grace, I can become the president. Right. Mm-hmm. If I have enough. Um, you know, if I have enough uh, grand presence, I can destroy the world, right? Mm-hmm. So instead of talking about using these discrete things, like I'm going to use my movement here to go here, and I'm going to then use my gun skill to shoot that guy, right? We skip all that. That's all assumed. If you have a gun, we assume you're really good with your gun, right? And if you want to be really, really good with your gun, you can take extra talents and stuff to make yourself really, really good with your gun, right? You don't become really, really good with your gun by increasing a stat, okay? Um, the way we do it is every, every career, basically class, has the thing they're good at, right? It's called an element. I've seen a couple other games sort of employing this as well. But the element is like, it's just a one-word term that says what you're good at. And... If you're in your element, you might. You're, it's easier to get bonuses. If you're not in your element, it's easier to get penalties. 
And that's it. Super elegant, super simple. So if you are an ace pilot, your element is like mecha combat, right? It's just as simple as that. Um, if you're, you know, if you're a captain, and we have three for captain, a lot of the classes have three elements, exemplar, tactician, I, you know, I, I'm, I have to get the book to remember. But you employ your intent through your element and you use a skill, right? And because of all this, we don't have a lot of depth of the character. I would say a lot of depth of the characters. We have appropriate le we have appropriate levels of depth of the characters and the mecha. Because I'm saying I want to shoot something, right? I want to attack, right? I mean, and you attack with all your weapons, right? I mean, why would you not attack with all your weapons? Right? If I got if I got guns and I got missiles, and I got lasers, and I have 15 seconds to do stuff, why why am I just rolling to attack with my gun? Right? I'm attacking with everything. Right? That isn't that how you do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, would would you do something different? I mean, I don't. I, I wouldn't. I would, I would use everything I had. And maybe if I was just really good with my gun, I'd just use that. But it doesn't matter because if I'm a pilot and you're a pilot, we're both we're both good at doing our jobs. Yep. So, if I use angelic grace, right? I am like moving in swiftly, but with but with like a calm grace. And you're shooting me, and I'm just like not even moving. The bullets aren't even hitting me, right? Just like you see in anime and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I roll my dice right, to do the attack, whether it's a sword or gun or all of my weapons or whatever, right? And so now I'm like, that's how you use, that's how you use your intent, right? Mm -hmm. The skill is attacking. Uh, um, I'm sorry. The action is attacking. The skill is angelic grace. And you know, I get a dice pull with that. Um, and my element is mecha combat if I'm the ace pilot. Now, <clears throat> let's put it this way. Let's say I'm completely surrounded with a ton of enemy mecha, right? Mm -hmm. And let's say maybe there's like an asteroid field nearby. Well, the first thing I might want to do is redirect them into the asteroid field, right? And I have, to, I have maybe I use chain fire to do that. So I'm chain fire, just blowing a whole bunch of bullets mm -hmm. to sort of like scare them and move them into, into the uh, field. The GM will apply, apply a, uh, a skill to that or apply, apply a challenge rating. So I hit the challenge rating, great. Um, and there's a lot of ways. We have seven different types of challenges. They're in there for the GM to employ at, at, at their will. So boom, let's say I'm successful. I move them in. And then I want to use Angelic Grace. Well, I'm, I'm diving between the asteroids and the mecha, right? Like like a, you know, sl a, a sleek assassin, right? And so... But I'm also an ace pilot, so the GM might be like, oh, that's really cool. I'm going to give you a bonus to that role, mm -hmm. right? Um, or you can, even use the, you can even use the asteroid field and say, I'm using the asteroid field right, to defend myself. Because as soon as someone attacks me, I'm going to like dive behind an asteroid. So now you have something to defend yourself with. And this is actually something fate does. It's called the aspects, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We, call it equipment, we call it equipment suite. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know fate did it until after we did, we did our book. <laughs> um, Although, truth be told, I think I, I, think I prefer the... Equipment equipment suite more than I do the um the aspects since well a big a big well, there's problem no narrative there's no narrative hook to it if you can use it you yeah. can use it you know well a big pro a big problem that I a big problem that I had with um with aspects which I which I laid out when I reviewed the Dresden Files which is basically the patient zero for fate as we, as everybody knows it now yeah yes yes. Um, Fate was a thing that Dresden Files hit, and then then people realized that fate could be a bigger thing. Yeah, the a big issue that a big issue that I've had with um, with how aspects are described is that it never really goes into what's a good or a bad idea for an aspect. Yeah. Uh, I I I it's to, because of because of how broad it is. It's it's a case where they're. There needs to there needs to be some de some degree of narrowing of, as far as what might be put what might be pushing what might be pushing the aspect idea a little too far and what might not. It's always the same number of dice too, right? In fate. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's so al it's always it's always four it's always um four fudge dice or two or two d sixes if you want to use the feng shui method, which they don't recommend. Yeah. Yeah, so in Robotech, what's nice is, is that the equipment suites, or, you know, using the environment, we call them equipment suites, mm -hmm. they are, um, you know, they they go from one to six. Mm -hmm. Usually, 
if you just say you're doing it, you always get one die. It's, it's, it's just an eye roll, right? The eye roll, right? You get one die. Yeah. If there's something there to help you, you get two. And if it's a good idea, you get three. Um, four is it has to be, you know, it has to really start coming. It has to meet like more a higher level of standards. But it is sort of GM fiat. Now, we actually do have a passive procedure. I talk about these procedures called worth of breath. If something is said, it can be utilized in the game. Right? So, and this goes in with fictional positioning changes, right? I just talked about, I'm moving these guys in the asteroid field. Now, I might have to observe in an earlier round to find the asteroid field, right? Using a, a, a skill, mm -hmm. right? As I described, uh, I'm using an action. Or the GM might just say, hey, there's an asteroid field there, right? Either way, once the asteroid field is uncovered, I have free reign to use that asteroid field as, as I see fit. Now, the nice thing about the asteroid field is like, maybe it also soaks up missile fire, right? It's a debris field. Maybe it's harder to shoot missiles, or maybe you can't even use missiles, or maybe if you use them, it's a sticky situation, or the missile fire doesn't actually hit the target, it blows up in your face, right? Because it hits a little rock in front of you. So, you know, this whole, this thing that I described, um, redirecting, um, using chain fire, you know, getting them into the asteroid field, and then using angelic grace, right? Here's the thing, right? It... <laughs> You've, so what we've just done in one round of, of play, because you get two actions in a round plus an equipment suite, mm -hmm. would take like how many discrete six-second actions in any other system, right? Because mm -hmm. my intent is to use my angelic grace in this fictional positioning. So the thing is, is I'm getting 100% of what I want to do. That might not succeed, but I'm getting 100 because it's an intent, right? Intents are always completely... They're always completely um, realized, right? So it's a top-down design, right? Versus bottom-up design, where okay, I have to, you know, I'm I'm going to shoot my gun to do this. Well, who says? If we really want to talk about like, why are you good at a gun? Why are you good at shooting a gun, right? Um, there's an infinite number of reasons why you could be good at a gun. I could be good at a gun because I'm because I'm trained, right? I could be good at a gun because I'm lucky. I could be good at a gun because I'm intuitive. I just kind of know where to send the bullet. Right. I could be good in a gun because I'm really aware, right, of everything, uh, you know, the, the hardness of the ground, the crispness of the air, right? Mm -hmm. um, I could be really good. If you keep on going, right, once you employ that word enough, you, you can be a good at a gun and, like, firing. You could be just really strong. The gun has no kickback, right? So, sure, you don't hit a lot because you're not that accurate, but you're, the kickback isn't causing you to be less accurate, right, versus somebody else who might be more accurate, but the kickback causes them to be less accurate, right? These are all different things, um, that can occur when you shoot a gun. But let's say, let's say in most systems you're using what agility plus pistol, right? Or agility plus assault rifle. Well, what if, what if the enemy's invisible? Mm -hmm. How can, your agility can't help you. Not really. Not all of it. Sure. I mean, it helps having high agility. Why would why would have a high agility hurt you? But really, that's where your awareness comes in, or your intuition comes in, or your luck comes in, right? And you can always pick something better. You can always pick something better in a situation than what you have in a bottom-up in a bottom-up um, procedural system, right? So you're hoping that maybe the thing you do leads you to a die roll that ultimately ends up doing something that might be cool. And you know what? Sometimes it does. It's just it's pretty rare. I mean, but in Robotech, everything you're doing is cool all the time because your intent is exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Right? <clears throat> I want to dance between asteroids like a freaking. Mecha Ninja using my Angelus Great Skill, right? Yeah. I'd give you, a, I'd give you a, a bonus in a heartbeat. Now, here's the thing. You don't actually have to redirect the enemies. Your buddy can do it for you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, here's another example. Let's say I'm like the Red Baron, right? I'm the Red Baron of Mecha. I'm a, a Trey's Kushranada, right? Interesting, um, interesting, po interesting choice, but I'll go with it. Right. Everybody knows who Trey Krishnanada is, right? He just he kills everything he sees. So, and he's, he's hiding behind a big asteroid, right? Mm -hmm. And boom, he pops out, right? And, and the intent here is I'm going to use ambush tactics and I'm going to use uh, grand presence, basically saying I'm like the Red Baron, right? Now, boom, you have shock and all, right? And that's what you're doing, right? You're catching them off guard. And then when they see who you are, they're even more caught off guard because they're like, oh, F, this is like this, this is this like insanely good pilot. We're just totally screwed, right? And the fact of the matter is, you don't even have to shoot that many bullets. They're so panicked in that situation, and that's what that's what the intent does, right? The intent the intent provides the players and the GM with more so than just like I'm firing a bullet and I'm hitting an armor class, right? The intent the intent provides with all this other stuff. Like, I don't have to fire that many bullets because they're just really scared. I'm just gonna pick them off, right? Like mm -hmm. fish in a barrel. Now, 
let's say you don't have that big rock to hide behind. Let's say it's like a, like once again, it's an asteroid field. Well, mm -hmm. okay, the enemy sees you flying through. They know who you are. They see you at a distance. You don't get the shock and all, but they can't quite lock onto you because the asteroids are in the way, right? Mm -hmm. So now that, that might, you actually might take a penalty using those skills. Or, you know, maybe you're just even Stevens, right, at mm -hmm. that point. Well, um, what happens if your buddy distracts the, you know, the enemy by using like a redirect action, right? Yet your buddy will say, my intent is I'm going to use, I don't know, shock and all, whatever skill they have, shock and all to distract them from trays flying around, the Red Baron flying around this asteroid field, right? There are, he's already a little hard to see in that asteroid field. So what if I obscure him, right? And I obscure him by distracting the mecha. So now you come out of nowhere, not only you know, do they not know you were there? They're also actually extra distracted by something else, right? And this is how teamwork synergy and fictional positioning works along with the intents. You're actually building a really cool, massively cinematic story, right? Just by playing the basic rules. Mm -hmm. And these are things anyone can do. I mean, it's just how the game works, right? There's, there's nothing special happening there. You just have to be aware of your, you just have to have a little bit of creativity and, and have a GM that provides you with information and you have to then dissect the information and apply. Mm -hmm. So that's where the mental load is. The mental load isn't on like calculating up all your bits, right? I'm here, I'm in this, I'm flying this fast, I have this bonus, I'm here, um, you know, I have this defensive bonus because behind asteroids, yada, 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 right? It just, it just comes into play. Um, and it's extremely rewarding and very easy. Like new time players, players who have never played a role playing game ever in their lives can, can come in because all they have to do is look at their skills and say, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, with the, now with all that in mind, give, given what given what we've got here, with um, with the first with the first book, the core book, mm -hmm. you were you were primarily focused on the Macross saga, right? Um, and with so you had the, all those rules in there and skills yeah. and everything. <laughs> well, yeah, set, setting the ground running and and cover and covering the Macross saga that that mo, that most folks are going to be um, familiar with. Whereas with um ho with with Homefront, you get you guys are covering mm -hmm. a lot more a lot more than just that. Covering covering some stuff with the Masters, the ASC, mm -hmm. the UEEF, mm -hmm. and the Invid. Um, mm -hmm. No, that's a you know, that's a factions. whole lot. That's a whole lot more factions. That's a whole lot of a step up from just covering two factions last time around. Yep. Um, and this this of course means the essentially you're covering the bulk of the masters and new gen and new generation eras. And the first thing the first thing that I'm cu that I'm curious about is how, is how you manage to make. Each of those four, each of those four factions, unique from each other, so that when so that somebody um, somebody playing um, multiple types that isn't going to feel like they're crossing over too much within the system. Um. So actually, I don't think we really did. We just try to get stuff to work the way we th we think it works in the shows, right? So we went with lore masters, people who really know the series, mm -hmm. and we said, you know, hey, we have rules for this mecha. Seem like it's functioning the way it should when you play test. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. No, okay, let's fix it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I think it's more about exuding the expectations from of you know what we see in the shows and um, you know and it's, it's some interpretation, some intuition. Like you know, has thin armor. Okay, it's not going to have a lot of structure. Right. That kind of stuff. Um, you know, there are some there are some there was some future proofing put into the book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one, one of those things is that. Like a mecha does ten light damage, right? If you get shot with, you know, a GU eleven, which is a standard Veritech gun, mm -hmm. right? It has two hundred two hundred rounds of fifty five, I think it's fifty five millimeter exploding ammunition, right? If you get shot with one of those, you take ten damage. You have three health. You're three times dead, basically. Um and that's probably being generous, right? So we have this ten to one system in place. However, if the mecha shoots at you, and gets three successes, he's not doing 30 damage. He has three successes. Each hit counts as 10 damage. So you can avoid that shot by getting three successes. Um, and so that's that's kind of how the system sort of works out, right? You have, for example, Cyclones, 
that have light armor, they could take a hit. You know, they have like 12, 15, 15 light, right? So they can, they can get hit a little bit. But they also carry mecha level weapons, right? So the thing is, you don't want to be in a prolonged fight with mecha level enemies. But you can do it a little bit. And if you are using... And the Cyclones have something called Nimble. It's an equipment suite. Mm -hmm. And it guarantees them defense. Right? So you get to roll two, I think, or two or three extra dice every time just because if you want more defense. Just for being small and quick and, and can jet around. Um, so that helps defend them against that as well. Right? So... That's kind of like, you know, it's really hard to, when you watch the series, you know, sometimes the heroes get shot by like, a, uh, you know, at one point Scott gets hit by like an Annihilation disc in New Gen, right? Mm -hmm. And he just like falls over and holds his shoulder. Well, normally those shots just like blow up Mecha, right? <laughs> it's like, he probably just took like 20 damage there, right? <laughs> or something, something crazy. And he's got like three hit points. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, sometimes the heroes get a little bit of an edge from a narration standpoint in the show. And we didn't really want to try to convey, you know, push that through. We wanted to try to make these things as, as actual as possible. So that's that's kind of how we did it. You know, it, it was it was more about, you know, a cross between real world and what we see in the show, and you know, just sort of what people think about these uh, these mecha. Yeah. Now, with uh, with all of that with all of that in mind, um, when, was. When it came when it came to when it came to do when it came to doing Homefront, um, mm -hmm. was this was this something that you had that when you were finishing up the core book that you had in that you had in the ba had in the back pocket to work on later? Um, I mean, we kind of started writing it right away. Um, it took a little while to get it written. I started with Invid. I didn't really know a lot about Invid, just from what I see in the show. And so, you know, we're using, we are using, like, expanded universe material, but we're also trying to keep the expanded universe material to what was on Earth and not was away from, right? And we'll have that in the next book, The Sentinels. Mm -hmm. Sentinels and Shadow Chronicles uh, is going to be uh, the next. <laughs> yes, the, um, the sent the s the funny thing about the Sentinels is I think, is I think Palladium got more use out of the Sentinels than the actual show did. You're right. Yeah. Now, well, the show. Um, yeah, the sh yeah, the show. Well, there wasn't. Much okay. Made. Okay. Calling it a show was a bit generous. It was. A, it was a glorified pilot that didn't go anywhere. Um, a three, three. It was like a three episode OVA. Right. You yeah. Play, you just, like, yeah. Okay. It was. It was meant to be a pilot for a Robotech follow up. Um, it didn't stick, and the, and it and just got released as that three episode, um, OVA. Um, yeah. Of course, of course, in two thousand, Harmony Gold would try again with Robotech three thousand, which never happened. <laughs> I I wasn't there. I wasn't there, but the story I'd heard was that the convention that they um that they debuted at, they got booed off the stage. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I guess I guess pe I guess people weren't ready for two for two thousands era CG Robotech. Oh yeah, well you know <laughs> CG wasn't the best back then. <laughs> um, oh, some of the research that I look into. Um, I, the trailer the trailer for it was included as a DVD extra for Shadow Chronicles, if I recall. It's it's just one of it's just one of those fun it's just one of those funny things. They from what I heard they they had contacted the same animation studio who was re was responsible for the um, CG Voltron that was going on around the time. I didn't, which I, oh, yeah, which yeah, I yeah. only saw like one episode of. I think they were, all, I think they were also responsible for Shadow Raiders, which I did see more of, which was all right. Um, but the, but I can, I can definitely see that with the, it, with the invids, since from whatever, from what I remember from back then, the a lot of first off doing bio, doing bio mecha is. Going to, is going to be a bit of a ch is going to be a bit of a challenge, but also the fact that the me that the mech that that um you're do that you're effectively doing four factions at once. When a lot of people when they remember Robotech, they mostly focus on the Macross saga, not so much on the m stuff that happened afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. So. 
did when it came to writing Homefront, were, did you did you write it with the mi- with the mindset that for a lot of people this is going to be either their first introduction to that era, or the or a re- and or a reintroduction after years? Well, um, I think it's a little challenging, right? And this is the challenge of any kind of IP, right? So, like, look at Robotech, Robotech uh, reconstruction. Mm-hmm. It it's a really, really good game, um, but because it has Robotech on it, people are like, well, I don't know Robotech, right? I'm like, what's well, a board game? It shouldn't really matter, right? I mean, if you don't, if you don't know Root, right? I don't know. You know, I don't know Evendell, right? I don't know, like, a lot of these different kind of worlds that are being set up in these, uh, I don't know Gloomhaven, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but because people, you know, because it's an IP, people don't, like, know the IP, it can actually hold things back, right? So I'm, we, um, we, um, you know, I think we're really expecting... Robotech to be mainly purchased by people who are familiar with Robotech, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, of course, we know that some people are new to it, um, and we try to provide context for what Robotech is. I and mean, if you look at the book, it says, you know, what right on there, like, what is Robotech? You know, what is Robotech about? Um, and that's both from like a playability standpoint, what do they expect to get from the show, but also. Um, but also, like, you know, just give me information on the series, right? So, mm-hmm. um, so I think that's, you know, that's what, you know, we are, I think, trying to do. So with Homefront, I think some people would be like, oh, wow, this looks really cool. It's really great art. It has a whole world built around it. People may, you know, people may want to jump into that. But I think for the most part, we're dealing with people that already really know the series, right? And I think until we get, like, a movie or, like, you know, quote-unquote Netflix reboot, which, as far as I know, is not being discussed. Um, I'll, I've heard, I've heard, I've, when it comes to the movie thing, it's a, ca- it's a case of, um, until, until I, t- until I see a trailer, it's, it, I, my, my, my mindset is stop dicking me around. <laughs> because right, of course, I've, yeah, I've yeah. been hearing I've been hearing stories about about the about the movie being in development off and on for the past fifteen years. Oh. <laughs> right, yeah, and you know, Darius, my partner, and I—I I mean, we were guests at Comic Con. We actually run a panel, mm-hmm. Comic Con. Um, um, what was that? Twenty eighteen, I think. And you know, they were talking about it then. You know, we haven't. Um, you know, it first talks about the director. The director was doing um, Kingsman. Uh, uh, it it the director was doing it and yeah, because he was director, doing it, he was tied up. And but then there's a director change. There's like two director change. I mean, it was just so much, right? They had it uh, seemed like they had a writer nailed down, but then that writer bit. Then that writer bailed to work on Kingsman. R- right, right, and and so you know it. You know, I I don't really know much about why it's not, you know, moving forward. Um, yeah, I I don't you know. know either. I don't know either. I just find I just find the whole thing um, funny. <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, it'd be great to. I mean, remember, part of why we bought we bought into the license was we wanted to, you know, we wanted to leverage off of the potential movie, and we knew that maybe it would never ever happen um or maybe you know but if it did we thought thought that could really leverage what you know what we were getting out of the ip i i can i can certainly get behind that um now when it now when it comes now as now as i understand it um there are two there are two there's going to be some new careers added to Homefront to ref- to reflect the mm-hmm. um the the arcs being covered. I'd like I'd like to go over yeah. I'd like to go over those careers and what and what their particular stylings would be. So yeah, so the thing about Homefront is it's really about defending the Earth, right? Or mm-hmm. having these aliens drop down and and being part of these like conflicts, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know. I think the lessons of Robotech is no fighting ever needed to happen if we just like talked about it, right? <laughs> that like 
the, you know, like Zentradi were there. Zentradi just wanted, they just wanted the uh, SDF-1, right? So if they came down, they're like, hey, we want that ship or it'll destroy your planet. Humans would probably go, yeah, just take the ship. See you later, right? Well, to, be, thing, to, be right? Fair, to be fair, adding the whole or we'll destroy your planet doesn't ex isn't exactly a strong negotiation tactic. Yeah, right. But when you get, you know, when you have four million ships. <laughs> so, um, you know, but I'm just saying if they would have talked about it, and they're like, hey, seriously, guys, we're, we're just here for the ship. Right. That's all we want. Maybe, maybe we can split it. Maybe we can like, you know, maybe, maybe we can find a way to like work together. Right. I mean, it obviously they, they definitely could have. Right. You know, they could have worked together on it. Um, so, but, you know, same thing with with the, when the masters come. Right. By the way, the masters knew about the invid. No one else did. So they're like, hey, uh. By the way, like if you're not careful with this stuff, like you know, your plants can get destroyed by the invid, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, you're gonna you're gonna take you're gonna take that you know you're gonna take that. Uh, I think it's a little bit of like a little bit of a grain of salt, right? But anyway, it's it's about defending the Earth, and so against a much superior technological force, and so we really wanted to show that there was like. A very dark um but not just dark a very um uh like apocalyptic feel to it right you're in this world that's been torn up right all the people are dead everything's been destroyed what do you how do you how do you fight back how do you survive you know what do you do and so yeah our careers um our careers try to well one of them does right so we have the drifter which is um dusty airs sort of mm -hmm. right or even Rand is sort of like a drifter. He's kind of going around, and then he becomes more of like a like a like a fighter. Um, but and then we have the triumvirate, right? So you can play as a trio of of um, of uh, Trollians, right? The Masters, mm -hmm. right? So those are the two new careers, and then we have a new we have a like a scavenging table, going out trying to find stuff. And then we have a survival. Oh, so we have a new conflict survival, right? So it's about literally, you know, traveling through the wilderness and what can happen to you. Um, and conflicts are, you know, the, the crux of how the system works, right? The GM throws out conflicts and then the, you have to engage those conflicts, right? A conflict could be a fire's breaking out. A conflict could be children trapped in rubble. Uh, a conflict could be, a, um, you know, enemies are attacking, swarming, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But the environment itself is actually, can actually be a conflict. Um, so, um, so yeah, so all that stuff is really, is really geared towards trying to, you know, provide that side of like, that like feeling. Does that make sense? That mm -hmm. sort of, yeah. yeah. Um, now with, now with that, with that said, when it comes to, when it comes to some, when it comes to some of the the expand the expanded arsenal is one other thing I'm, I'm curious about i'm curious about um is a lot is a lot of it just at adding more weapons or do some of those weapons have some special rules to um to bear to bear into account well yeah so basically you know we had we had a, we had a couple problems right one of the problems was what what do you do with the cyclone right and the other problem was what do you do with the Veritech, right? What do you do with the VF, the VF one? Um, and so we needed something to say, hey, this is future technology. This future technology is superior to, um, you know, the VF one for the most part, right? Not everything's literally one hundred percent better, but you know, for the most part, right? Technology advances. Clearly, the weapons they're on even like less, sophi less sophisticated, mecha. Than the VF1 are better than what the VF1 carries. So we, you know, we really had to try to make sure that everything felt like it was a progression of technology mm -hmm. forward. And you know, we once again we had to make, try to make make sure everything kind of acted like you know you think it acts. If that makes sense. So, but you know, so many people love the cyclones, and like I love them. Right, I have a motorcycle. I, I ride a motorcycle like mm -hmm. to work. You know, whatever around around the neighborhood. So like I love them too. And what do you do with them? How do you make them good? Or how do you make them like be what you feel like they should be? And so, you know, and there's also a bunch of stuff from like the expanded universe and there's all these different types of weapons and we, we try to like give everything a feel for what it can do. Um 
they're clearly superior to the older to the older stuff, but not necessarily by a lot. Um, you know, most things things start to possibly uh, ignore armor a little more, right? So armor becomes a little lighter because just things more things are ignoring it. But then we added resistance, and resistance it gives you armor that can't be ignored, right? So if something has penetration three and you have resistance two, then it only becomes penetration one. Um, and that's how we get around like machine gun fire and stuff, right? You can you can resist like the for example, uh, like a 50 caliber machine gun, I think absorbs two, uh, sorry, ignores two light armor, basically just pierces light armor. Mm -hmm. But a, a cyclone has resistance of three. So that basically, that 50 caliber machine gun works the same as like a standard assault rifle against against um, a cyclone. Mm -hmm. Or it might do two damage, right? The damage still carries, so it doesn't have the penetration. But um, I, I have to look at the action, I have to look at it, I can't exactly remember, but yeah. Mm hmm. Now, with now with that in mind, um, what are you shooting for as far as a as far as the total page count with the thing? Is do you think it's going to be around the same size as the main as the core book, or do you think it's going to be slightly smaller? Yeah, yeah. So I think we're we're trying um, to. Yeah, I think it's gonna be, it might be a little bigger, um, just because of so much so much art and so many art pieces we have to put into it and stuff. It's, it's hard to say when, you, when you're formatting, like, and you put big art pieces in that take up, like, half a page, um, mm -hmm. what, you know, what that really adds. Because we're looking at putting in we about 70 art pieces now. The initial buy-in is going to be another 66, plus probably another 20. So we're probably looking at, like, 160 art pieces in there. Um, if you, you know, if you tile that, that's probably going to come out to... Um, probably 100 pages of art. Basically, if you made an art book out of the art, it would be like 100 pages, right, or more. Um, like Age Past, right? So the, one of the first books I did is, if you tile the art, it comes out to a 72-page art book. It's just a massive amount of art in it. And same thing, we did a pretty good job with um, Super Age 2 at like 43 pages or something. And that's something I've always been very proud of, the amount of like art that we have in the books. Um, now, it's a unique art. Mm -hmm. So that means that if I double a piece up, I don't count that. Um, but yeah, so we're thinking between 250 and 300. Um, it might go up a little bit, 325. Uh, if it goes up too much, then I have to start selling the book for $70 or 65. Um, yeah. Of course, that doesn't affect the Kickstarter price, but yeah. Oh, yeah. And what, it, and what are you shooting for as far as a release window and... Incidentally, I want to offer my congratulations on how on how much you managed to just smash through your initial goal. Yes, our initial goal was very very light. It was basically to make POD copies for like fifty people <laughs> who back it, right? Um, and you know, we would just use the art we have. We'd probably invest more right into it. But you, this is really gauging what the what the audience wants, right? Like a lot of people want more GM screens, right? And they want a GM screen that's that's specifically set up for. Um, you know, that's set up for home front. That's, you know, but I'm like, guys, we made 500 screens and we've only sold like 150. Like, I, I'm not gonna make more screens. Like, I'm just, I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, it, it, if you want to make more screens, you gotta buy them. You know, I know to some degrees, those screens haven't gone out. They, people have been having trouble finding them in stores and stuff. You can definitely get it from our website. And, um, you know, and we sell them, like your retail stores can buy them from us. We'll sell them to your retail store at, you know, at wholesale price. Um, and we have it, you know, we have it on our website, the order form, or you know, and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, so I mean, you know, we we are hoping to get everything launched out by July, so we have it in time for Gen Con. Um, it's possible; it might be a little, it might be a little um, tough to do. We'll just see how it goes, you know. And part of it's our artist is going to get backed up. I'm basically going to have to buy him out and be like, hey, like you know, here's a lot of money, just go to town. You know, he has a day job too. Um, and we might try to employ a, a couple more artists, um, but I don't want to get away too much from, you know, I don't want to get away too much from Francisco because his style is so great and he's getting better. You know, his work's just, just so great. And he's, you know, he does work at such a reasonable price. So um, we really like to, if we can use him, we can get more out of him. But if we get slowed down on it, we have to determine do we push the project out a little bit or, or not. Mm -hmm. You know, and, Producing a book like this, I mean, it, it 
you can do a lot of things at once, right? So we can be gaining art at the same time that we are getting stuff approved, by the same time stuff is getting um, edited, right? Once it gets edited, I can start formatting. So I can always be like two days behind on edit on formatting, right? As the as the work is coming in, as the edited portions are coming in, I can copy and paste that into the document and start formatting, right? Um, you know, and usually I like to do when I'm formatting, I can do, you know, like anywhere from five to 20 pages a day. It just depends on how complicated the section is. Sometimes, man, I'm ripping through it. And other times, like, I just can't quite get these images to sort of like look good and how I want it to be. I'm, I'm pretty particular about it. And I think the book, book's beautiful. Uh, luckily, Dean Sherman, who is the the North American sales manager for um, Asia Pacific Offset, the company that made our book out of China, mm -hmm. he uses our book for the demo. When he takes books around to show how the quality Mm -hmm. He thinks our book is one of the most beautiful he's ever seen, and he's he's printed thousands of books. Mm -hmm. That's so that's, that's what we're that's what we're yeah that's what we're shooting for, right? <laughs> but right, and because it's me doing it, right? I don't stop just because it's kind of good enough, right? Mm -hmm. Like I I make sure that you know we have something really nice um, and filled, and you don't see a lot of you know I, I you know um. I've uh, I have some RPGs on my shelf that I'm a little disillusioned with the layout. Right, you'll just have you'll just have empty text, like empty areas of white page. And I'm like, put a story there, put put more abilities or powers. Like, what are you what are you doing? You know, like I, like why are you wasting this page? We, we try not to really waste any space at all. If there's space there, we we really try to put in um, we really try to put in um, um, something. Right, a, a piece of in-game fiction, a, a little a, a piece of art. Even if it's a duplicate of art, right? It's better than white space. I don't. I don't understand. Why would you not, you know, zoom in on an art piece that's already there, you know, versus, you know, versus have nothing. But yeah. So I mean, you know, that's. Um, so we can do it all at once, right? We can get the art, and at the same time, we're getting the art. We can also. Um, be formatting right we can also be editing and then also be formatting and also right and then send stuff for approvals as well right so i'm going to send this books out for approval and we have two sections of approvals right we basically have like mechanical portion mm -hmm. and then we have um the uh um we have like the scenario portion right and we have to be a little careful because there's also like penguin houses involved with the stories and if we you know we, we can't infringe and you know there's we have to you know that that became, became a problem in the first book a little bit with a uh, one of with one of Roy, Roy's stories is that they, they thought it felt like a little more like um something that um that was in the wheelhouse of somebody else you know and i'm like well but you know in-game fiction is part of rpgs right you can't really have an rpg without like in-game fiction so mm -hmm. and i will but i will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it shakes out um oh. But with all but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time mm -hmm. out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. Y and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further discuss Robotech, mechs in general, battle, the fact that you should never trust Capellans, or <laughs> or ju or just to do a glorified shit post, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I, I I don't I'm, I don't drink. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, more for me then. <laughs> yeah, more for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the worst. Yeah. No, I really appreciate you being here, and you listen to my long-winded responses, and uh, you know, I I always like talking about the stuff that we do. I always get you know I'm really passionate about it. I get really excited. Um, you know I. I, I think we're doing things, you know, in my Charm game that we put out, the, the RPG for Charm, you know, I think between Charm and Robotech, they're two of the most important RPGs that have been put out recently. And, you know, not people really understand, like, why, you know, and I think I think there's a lot to really, um, to, to break down, you know, um, and and understand. But, yeah, I love talking about uh, uh, um, RPG, you know, RPG design and design in general, actually. Mm-hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty yeah. more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar yeah, of the internet. 
they might have enjoyed it because I probably helped them get to sleep. <laughs> but until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>